In early 2023, Sanyolki, a town in Ecuador, was rocked by the brutal murder of a young woman. The surprising thing was not the gruesome carnage itself, but the reason for it. A stolen $600. Was the life of a 37 years old woman really worth $600? Paula Ortega Elcoser, born in March of 1986, was the second child in a large family. She excelled in school Dario Figuero Lara, then entered the Technical University, where she studied hospitality business. After her studies, she took an active part in the development of the family business in the production of holiday goods. Ortega Alcocer was a fairly wealthy and well-known family in San Yolki and nearby towns of Ecuador. Paola's father, in his younger years, began building a business supplying holiday merchandise to stores in Ecuador. The business became quite successful, which allowed him to open his own production of balloons, piñatas and other holiday items. The opening of several stores followed. Holiday shops of the Alcocer family were not only in San Yolki, but also in the capital of Ecuador, the city of Quiro. Each family member was involved in developing and managing the family business. The father developed and increased the main manufacturing facilities. He opened new workshops for the productions of balloons, garlands, caps and other holiday merchandise. Three children each had a store, where they organized everything according to their wishes. Entrepreneurial Paula was so in love with her father's business, so she went further and, in addition to the store, organized within the company services the organization of holidays. This was a great success. Paula seemed to have found her calling to bring joy to people, which made her absolutely happy. For quite a long time, the family was doing very well, unfortunately only in business. In Paula's personal life, a young and cheerful woman was haunted by failures. Paula's first marriage to Carlos Pedro was not happy. After the birth of a young daughter, he became addicted to alcohol. He began to disappear from home, stealing money from his wife's store. He cheated on the woman, and she broke up with him remaining alone with her daughter. Paula was going through such a difficult time, having lost hope for future love. Psychological support from her family and her favorite job helped her to return to her normal life. Ten years later, she meets Christian Diego, the tall, dark-haired, handsome man who was four years younger than Paula. Paula, who had already lost faith to meet a worthy man, was not so hasteful to start a new relationships. Christian was very calm and reliable. He quickly found a common language with Paula's daughter, which certainly made a positive impression on the woman. After two years of relationship, her heart completely melted and the beautiful wedding ceremony took place. Christian accepted Paula's daughter as his own. Soon they had another daughter, Maria. Christian and Paula lived together for five years. He joined Paula's father's company and took his place in the family business. He was entrusted with finding premises for new stores, so he was often away from home. Christian came from a simple, hard-working family and always dreamed of being the owner of a big business. But unfortunately, some people hide their dark sides so well that you can live next to violent criminals for years without realizing it. However, everything secret always gets revealed when evil comes out. The businessmen's spouses looked very happy. Paula's family, friends and neighbors spoke of them as a totally happy family. But as it turned out, only from a first glance. In 2000, Paula's father dies from a long illness. His death shakes not only the family, but also turns the business upside down. Christian, wanting the power and the money they provide, is insistent on taking Paula's father's place in the business, but what one can do doesn't mean the other can. 
Deals go bad, one after another. Christian takes out his anger on his family, first secretly and then openly. He begins to leave the family and spend his days and nights in a life of debauchery. Women and alcohol take him into a world of pleasure and excitement. Paula's father, who restrained it, the hot-headed son-in-law, now couldn't interfere. Having a trauma of a similar nature, Paula refuses to tolerate it again. One scandal after another follows, where Christian shows his real face. An ambitious egoist who wants only power and unconditional obedience. After another scandal, Paula secretly files for divorce. She was very afraid of her husband. The news of this radically changes the behavior of Christian. He, not wanting to lose his place in a successful family, stops his insolent behavior and changes in a positive direction. He repents and confesses that he was caught in a series of strange events, that he loves and cherishes his family and doesn't want to lose it. The woman did not want to be single again. He got a second chance. As a sign of reconciliation, Christian suggested that his wife organize a romantic dinner at home. She agreed. The next day, the children were sent to Paula's parents, and the woman herself made preparations. She was very sensitive to her husband's proposal, because deep down she still dreamed of a happy and strong family, and tried hard to keep it. In the evening, the atmosphere of festivity and coziness bloomed in the house. The garland stretched along the wall was shimmering in the living room, and the dining table was lit by the yellow flame of candles. Christian opened a bottle of white dry wine, and Paula served hot dishes. It would have been a truly reconciling evening had it not been for Christian's proposal, which had once again disturbed the peace of the house. The man was a shareholder in the Alcosar company. He told his wife that, while chasing the desire to replace her father completely, he had lost an important tender for the company. This led to a huge loss, and in the current situation, the company is in great need of a new investor. That man's only one thing – a part of the company would be officially transferred to the new owner. Paula was strongly against it. Because her father built this business only for his family, Christian's persuasion didn't help. The man was angry. After all, he had already found an investor and dreamed of pulling off what he wanted without any accidents. The dinner was ruined, and so was the couple's relationship. On January 2nd, 2023, it was an ordinary day. Paula took her youngest daughter to the playroom and went to the store to work. She had a large order, in which she was supposed to assemble balloon fountains and get all sorts of merchandise for a themed party. During her lunch hour, two men knocked on the store. The store was closed, but Paula opened up. She was waiting for a courier to pick up the balloon bouquet. The two men of skinny build were identically dressed, as if they were twins. The dark sweaters and hoods on their heads startled the woman a little. They took their time. They looked around and went off to different sides of the store. The woman called out to them, informing them that the store was closed for lunch. They surrounded her and pressed her against the wall. The fear and silence of this scene was interrupted by a knock on the glass door of the store. The two guys hastily ran out of the store. A smiling young courier rescued Paula from the unknown man. The woman handed over the package, closed the store, and with shaking hands, dialed her mother's phone number. The mother suggested reporting this case to the police, but Paula refused because nothing terrible had happened. She was just frightened. She did not open the store again that day. All her thoughts turned to Christian's actions. Who were these men? What could they possibly want from her? Paula decided to take a little walk around the town to calm herself down. She walked into a coffee shop in a nearby street. She took a leisurely stroll through the park to get some fresh air. Then she stopped by her sister's house. There, over a cup of sweet tea, they had a heart-to-heart -heart talk. In a rush of emotions from the shock, 
Paula told her not only about the two strange visitors who frightened her, but also about the difficulties in her family. She told her sister that Christian had changed a lot after her father's death. He began to drink alcohol, openly cheated on her. Paula kept silent about her husband's proposal to merge the company with a new investor. The woman never told her loved ones about her personal problems, but on that day her emotions took over her sense of pride and shame. Shame of accepting such humiliating treatment. He's a strange creature. My sister was upbeat, happy, fun, adventurous, hardworking woman, a super gentle and a sweet mom, Adriana Ortega, Paula's sister, later said. She had long plans for her life, which she told me about at the time. She wanted her daughters to grow up, to be professionals. She wanted to continue her business, a dedicated and tirelessly hardworking woman. After a heart-to-heart -heart talk with her sister, Paula headed home. A phone call made her stop. It was Christian calling. He informed his wife that he would pick up their daughter from the playroom and they would drive to the store together to pick her up. He was talking so fast, children's voices could be heard. Paula didn't have time to tell him what had happened to her at the store. So she had to go back to work. Once again, the woman was thinking about the well-being within the family, not within herself. Trip there didn't take long. All the necessary city infrastructure was 10 minutes away. Christian arrived alone. His daughter had asked him to go home, and he couldn't say no to his little princess. He informed his wife that the girls were home and were asking to bring them hamburgers for dinner. What modern family doesn't go to hamburger joints? But this time Christian took his wife not to the nearest diner, but to the food court at the mall, which was a few blocks away. He stopped the car at the wall of the parking lot and, after saying goodbye to Paula, went to pick up the order, locking the car with a central lock. The woman closed her eyes and relaxed after a difficult day, sitting in front seat of the car, waiting for her husband. But as it turned out, it was for nothing. After a couple of minutes, two identical figures familiar to her appeared near the car. They were talking loudly and walked around the car several times. The woman stood up from the voices she heard and recognized those unexpected visitors by their silhouettes. She tried not to panic, because the car was closed and her husband was about to return, but the car's headlights flashed mercilessly and the door lock buttons simultaneously went up. Paula rushed to the back seat and scrambled down between the seats, covering her head with her hands. It was a trap, however. There was nowhere for her to run. One of them opened the front door and seated himself in the driver's seat. The other got in through the back door and pinned Paula to the floor even harder. She felt something warm running down her arm. The next thing was darkness. Paula was stabbed 11 times in the neck and two times in the face. After the attack, the two ran out of the car. The woman never managed to meet her spouse again, but she was alive. After such a brutal attack, bleeding, she waited for help. Christian returned from the diner only seven minutes later. When he opened the car, he saw a gruesome scene. The seat and floor of the car were covered in blood. The man pulled out his cell phone and dialed 911. In his panic, he was unable to explain clearly to the emergency operator what had happened and give the coordinates for the ambulance. Afterward, he called Paula's mom and reported the assault. He got behind the wheel and drove to the hospital. Unfortunately, Paula died in the emergency room before receiving the care she needed. Christian, who was waiting in the emergency room, took the news too hard. He screamed through chairs. The loss of his wife shocked him. The first version of the prosecutor's office was a violent death for the purpose of robbery. Later it was found that from Paula's purse was missing $600, and the golden chain disappeared from her neck. An investigation was launched. The prosecutor's version was confirmed. The traces of two unknown men who had visited the woman's store were found on the city's traffic cameras. 
but they were both wearing hoods. No way to make a sketch of them was possible, and their descriptions provided no clarity. Two months after the woman's murder, her family is demanding justice, but the investigation stood still. In the course of another interview with relatives, Paula's sister, Adriana Ortega, gives testimony that casts doubt on Christian's non-involvement in the murder of his wife. She tells the investigation about a conversation she had with her sister on the day of the tragedy. She also reveals to the investigation that Christian regularly cheated and inflicted domestic violence on Paula, and she wanted to divorce him. It was the perfect motive for murder. After all, Christian didn't want a divorce. If his family broke up, he would lose his wealth and his title of a hero. An ambitious man couldn't let that happen. The prosecutor's office checked this version. During the search of the house, phones containing Christian's correspondence with numerous women were found. They also examined messages between husband and wife, which confirmed the difficult relationship between the spouses. One of the most important pieces of evidence was the prepared documentation of the transfer of the company to a private person with Paula's signature, which she refused to give. The prosecutor's office continued to gather information to prove Christian's possible involvement in Paula's murder. After some more time, the investigation has more and more new evidence that unravels the complex tangle of the couple's relationship. Two weeks after the incident, we discovered that he had made a transfer of $2,000 to a cart to an unknown woman, said Adriana, Paula's sister. What is most outrageous, relatives said, that the payment was made from Paula's account when she was dying. Instead of reacting instantly to provide first aid to his wife dying of stab wounds, Christian simply bided his time. The investigation verified this information. The identity of the woman who received the transfer from Christian that day was established. She turned out to be local, 28 years old Laura Castillo. She was summoned immediately for questioning. She said that she discovered the missing bank card about a couple of days ago, but did not pay any much attention to it. As her brother often uses her card, history of transfers revealed a $2,000 transfer from Christian on January 2nd at 8 hours and 5 minutes p.m., but she claimed she don't know the man. At the time of the murder, the woman had an unshakable alibi, proving she was not involved in the incident. She was released and the investigation again remained at a standstill. A few days later, the girl again contacted the police and reported that the bank card had been returned by her brother, as she had assumed. She was able to give a full description of her brother's appearance, which completely coincided with one of the criminals caught on CCTV cameras near the car. While fleeing the scene in apparent agony, one of the attackers forgets to put his hood on. Their identities have been established. Byron and Mortinus Castillo are two repeat offenders brothers who had extensive criminal backgrounds and multiple criminal convictions. The brothers were apprehended. But what connections could two former criminals and a decent successful family man have? The investigation went further and found that the attacks on Paula were repeated by the same Castillo brothers. So what did the criminal brothers want with the young woman? On December 8, 2022, Paula's car was stolen from a gas station. She was distracted by one young man, and the second one quickly got behind the wheel and stole the car. As luck would have it, the woman was in the car that day without her daughters. A check of CCTV cameras established two already familiar personalities. Coincidentally, it was on the day of the theft that Paula met her killers eye to eye. But then the hijacking case did not gain traction as Christian, who intervened, informed the investigation that the hijackers had already contacted him. He drove to a meeting where all his wife's personal belongings, including her purse, were given to him. This state of affairs added to the investigators' doubt about Christian's innocence. 
experienced investigators were surprised at the determination with which the recent widower covered up for the criminals. The CCTV cameras helped in this case too, to identify the hijackers. When Christian realized that he was under suspicion, he came up with a new plan of defense. The story about a racketeering scheme by two gangster brothers to get a large sum of money, but he didn't have time to use his version of justification. The police executed their plan faster. The classic surprise interrogation of all the suspects separately, with the bait that one of them told how it really happened, had a positive result. Martinez Castillo confessed that more than two months ago, Christian had paid him and his brother $2,000 to kill his wife, and was to transfer another $2,000 after the execution. At the investigation, Martinez testified how he stabbed the poor, terrified woman 11 times with a knife. Realizing that the crime had been solved, he gave away all the details of their relationship with Christian without regret. Martinez told investigators that the carjacking was also part of Christian's plan to pressure the woman, as was the attack on the store. Just coincidentally, Paula lived a few hours longer. On November 29, 2023, all three suspects went on trial in the courtroom. The prosecutor's office presented a complete picture of what happened on the day of the murder. Surveillance videos of the sector where Christian parked his car, discovered by the prosecutor's office and subjected to audio and video forensic analysis, tell the full chilling story. The images show Christian Diego getting out of the car. He appears to walk inside the mall to the elevator. A few minutes later, he returns and unlocks the car door with the remote control, while already half a block away from his vehicle, and immediately after that, the two perpetrators get into the car to stab Paula. After committing the offense, the man turned around numerous times, the prosecutor's office report states. He left the premises, went back to see where the car was, walked to it, stopped, went back. It was like he was stalling for time, walked back and forth. Then he talked to someone on the phone. Then he walked away from the car in the opposite direction, walked one block before returning to the car. When he saw his wife bleeding, he was not shocked and did not rush to help her, but took her to the farthest hospital. Based on the camera footage reviewed, Christian's actions were reconstructed minute by minute. The court was especially disturbed by the first four minutes after Paula's murder when the woman was bleeding in the car, but was still alive and in need of help, her husband, standing next to the car, in cold blood, transferred money to accomplices for the murder. Attorneys for Paula's family are asking that these videos be admitted as aggravating circumstances to the crime. The fully reconstructed picture of that horrific day presented at trial proves that hours before the crime, Two subjects enter Paula's store around 1 hour and 30 minutes p.m. They were transported to a neighboring street by none other than Christian, meaning that the crime should have been committed in the afternoon, when the store was closed for lunch and Paula was there alone, thus proving that the robbery murder presented was a carefully planned one. How did the two perpetrators know that the couple was going to a diner if they did not drive a car or motorcycle to follow the car? Yet they arrived at the location and committed the crime. Prosecutor Marlene Calderon said at the hearing, not raising the window fully, unlocking the car doors at the place where he bought the hamburgers, going around a thousand times before helping his wife making phone calls and not assisting his wife at the nearest clinic are some of the evidence that will help to convict him of femicide. Femicide is a gender-based hate crime defined as the intentional killing of a woman for being a woman. Quite a few personal facts from Paula and Christian's family were presented at trial as hatred of women. It's hard to believe this exists in today's world. Christian was only four years younger than his wife. 
which was the main reason for his wife's abuse. Paula's many years of humiliation as a woman were carefully hidden not only from her entourage, but also from Christian's relatives. Young, successful Paula lived as if in a golden cage, covering up and encouraging the behavior of her tyrant husband, allowing him to prove himself. Years of silence led to an insidious plan to seize his wife's holiday empire and sole custody of his daughter Maria. Interviews with over 10 witnesses, neighbors, friends, examination of all correspondents inside and outside the family revealed Christian's real face and his goals. Having no right to sign, he wanted to force his wife to sign the documents on the transfer of shares in the company. His plan was a failure. Christian didn't kill his wife. He gave her a real psychological abuse, which he had carefully disguised for years. According to the Attorney General's Office report, based on the video footage found, Christian was placed in preventive isolation as an instigator of the crime. Preventive isolation is not detention, but merely a plan of action to remove a person who possess a danger to society. After this measure was granted, the man planned to flee. Christian's defense tried very hard to portray the man as a victim. They were unable to refuse such crucial evidence as CCTV footage and false documentation of the firm's transfer. Then, the defense desperately tried to make the perpetrator look like a person with a mental disorder. After all, he had episodes of sudden anger. Christian was interviewed by several psychotherapists, but he was found to be sane. Advice was given by the defense to leave the country as an escape option. The lawyer said to him, Do you have your passport ready? Receiving an affirmative answer, he replied, then tomorrow you should buy a ticket to Panama. But even this plan of the tormentor failed. After the lawyer's advice, the alleged femicide organizer started looking for a ticket to travel to Central American countries. This alarmed the authorities. The prosecutor ordered the urgent detention of Christian Diego for eight hours, and for the purpose of investigation, charges were filed and details were released to the domestic violence judge. The suspect has been in the pretrial detention pending a court ruling. He is being prosecuted as the alleged organizer of the femicide and the instigator of the murder. Paula Ortega's family is demanding justice for such a horrific crime that left two minor children without a mother and all of the family with irreplaceable loss. After reviewing the case file, the jury concluded that all three were guilty of a carefully planned, premeditated murder with extreme cruelty. Christian and his two accomplices were sentenced to 26 years in prison. The municipal authority of the administrative center of Rumingyavi expressed their condolences to the family with the tragic end of the life of a dear businesswoman, friend, mother and wife who together with her family contributed to the development of the canton, federal unit, and gave the gift of well-being to those who shaped her surroundings. The written statement reads, Paula's case was one of the many. Latin American Association for Alternative Development registered 332 deaths of women due to gender violence in 2022.